Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Cutting Edge Figure Skating Podcast. My name is Kim Dunaway, and in this episode, I will be covering the 2024 Canadian Nationals. So Canadians happened this past weekend in Calgary, Alberta, and you would think in a city that's hosted the Olympics, albeit a number of years ago, over 30 years ago, you would think it would be like a mecca of figure skating fans. This event was so sparsely attended. It was honestly depressing. As a viewer, I'm sure it was extremely depressing for the skaters as well. The viewing experience, like it was very poorly lit. I couldn't tell if it was poorly lit in the arena or if that was just the effect that we got on camera. Now, we always certainly like massive kudos to Skate Canada for putting their product for free on the internet where everybody can see it. But boy, it was it was really tough to watch the events, which frankly, a lot of them were very poorly skated as well. But still, I heard that ticket prices for the event were outrageous. And that was a huge barrier to people coming. I don't know if because they're also hosting Worlds this year, which I've also heard the tickets are very expensive for not Calgary, but Canada is hosting Worlds. It'll be in Montreal if maybe people feel like that they've got to pick one event or the other. Coming off of just seeing Europeans where they had, you know, basically like a sold out arena, from my understanding, they had pretty low ticket prices, made it affordable for people to be able to come. So my mind, which works as a business brain on some level, I'm like, okay, you can have a thousand people that pay a hundred dollars a ticket, or you can have 10,000 people that pay $10 a ticket. The revenue is the same, but having more people in the seats is much more beneficial on a number of levels. One thing, having a full arena is a much better effect. It's a much better environment for the skaters. You get more people to buy concessions, swag, posts on social media, like all the things. So I get that there's a certain amount of revenue that they would like to get from these events. I cannot imagine that whatever revenue that they got from ticket sales this weekend was enough to rationalize whatever they were charging. At that point, if ticket sales were that low, I might just open it up for free. I mean, it was so, so sad. I'm very interested to see what Worlds looks like. I'm sure it'll be vastly better, but it was really, really depressing. And it it just makes you go, maybe they should, maybe State Canada should look at a strategy kind of like what U.S. did last year at Boston for Skate America. They picked a much smaller rink that they were able to feel to give it more of an effect than having, you know, arena that was sparsely attended. Perhaps it would have been better if they would have put everybody in one section than have them all spread out. It was just a bad look. And as I mentioned, the skating as a whole was also really bad. So unfortunately, it was going head to head at times with Europeans. And so the one event I didn't get to see almost any of it at all was the women's event. So we'll start off with that because I literally only saw Madeline Skeezes short program and that was it in two days of competition. I guess I should have done like the two screen thing where I had one device on Europeans and one device on Skate Canada. But to be perfectly honest, I forgot about Canadian nationals. (laughs) Like, so I guess I was kind of like the Canadian spectators as well. It was not forefront on my mind. And I've also heard that they didn't even televise the event in Canada either. So that's what I've heard. If that's wrong, somebody please let me know. But although, again, especially like the men's and ladies events, I kind of get it, <laughs> but I don't think you're, you're helping your sport out at all by not putting something out. I mean, I guess their thing was, well, we've just got it online. People can watch it online, but, ugh. but like you need to, you know, you brought Ted Barton out to do commentary, like just put it on TV, but okay. All right. So let's dig into the results a little bit. We'll start with the ladies. Cause like I said, I didn't see 
basically any of this. So this event was won by Kaya Ruder. So Kaya is junior national champion from 2020. She's not had a tremendous amount of success since then. She's always kind of been like just on the brink. She's had a good program here and then maybe not a good long program to go with it. We have seen her internationally this year three different times. She was at Cranberry Cup, Autumn Classic, and at Skate Canada. She was second at Autumn Classic, third at Cranberry Cup. Those were her best showings. Didn't have the best showing at Skate Canada where she was just 10th. Did not get any more internationals after that. Shows up here, does okay in the short program. She has a real tough time in the short program with oftentimes under rotation calls or edge calls. And that has kept her from getting her tech minimums. So let's just have a quick conversation about tech minimums because this is a huge deal for both singles and ladies and men. Canadian women... There's only one skater that has tech minimums for worlds, and that is Madeline Skisas. And so tech minimums, you have to have a, a minimum technical score. So that is the, not the program component score, but simply just the, the base value plus GOE of the elements of the program. And so for worlds, women have to have a 32 as a minimum technical score. The tech minimums for four consonants and conversely for European countries, for Europeans are lower than they are for worlds. And oftentimes Olympics will be sort of somewhere in between. So in this case, Kaya has tech minimums to four, four consonants, for instance, but she does not have the minimum technical score in the short program. She does for the long program, but not the short program, which means that she cannot go to worlds until she gets those tech minimums. The only female in Canada that does have those world technical minimums is Madeline Skisis, which means she's the only skater at this point that they could send to worlds. If she were to get injured in between now and worlds, they would be screwed unless Sarah Maud Dupree or Justin McClett get tech minimums that they need to be able to take her place. We'll get to that when we talk to them about them. So this is an issue with Kaya because Obviously, as national championship, they couldn't send her to Worlds. They probably wouldn't, even if she had tech minimums. I think they'd probably, I don't know. I mean, if she had tech minimums, would they send her to Worlds? It's a good question. Madeline Skisas has been basically holding all of Canadian women's figure skating on her back for the past, like, three seasons since, like, the 2021 season. And she has done it very well. But she definitely would benefit from having some local competition and there really hasn't been any this here she's now lost the title obviously to Kaya Ruder but Kaya was already designated to go to the youth olympics which is the same week as four continents and so they opted to continue to send her to youth olympics which is fine and they're also going to send her to junior worlds also fine but she can't get tech minimums there which means again she couldn't go to worlds so that's their choice. They've decided that they're not going to send her to Worlds. They're just going to continue to send her to junior events and okay, but she does need to develop for seniors. And personally, I think it's a mistake. I think Four Continents is a bigger deal than Youth Olympics, but whatever, especially since you have three spots to Four Continents, but whatever, she's not going. She's going to Junior Worlds. She was at Junior Worlds last year where she finished 10th. She was also at Junior Worlds in 2020 where she did not make the free skate so she has at times i think it was at warsaw cup in maybe 2022 where she did fantastic but she's just very inconsistent and up and down and part of that may be because she hasn't had the experience because canada for whatever reason doesn't like to send their skaters out and you're beginning to see the fruits of that because you have a lot of skaters who are undeveloped or again, don't have tech minimums to compete at world championships, and that's a problem. So, but this has to be a huge step in the direction of Kaya Ruder. She's, I remember, again, I didn't see her skates here, but I did see her skates at both Autumn Classic and at Skate Canada. She's just lovely, just useful exuberance and energy and a great spark when she skates. She loses points on her spins, 
and on her step sequences, which has also prevented her from getting her tech minimums in addition to those under rotation calls that she often gets. She's actually a pretty consistent skater. I mean, looking at her score sheets from Canadian Nationals, she looks like she landed everything, but I think she had like four Q calls in her free skate. So that's something that they've definitely, you know, got to work on with her. But I think she's got a lot of potential. And we'll see how she does at some of these junior events that she is now slated to go to this season. Okay, on to Madeline Skisos, who I did see her short program. And it was skated well. And she's had massive improvements this season over what we saw her do last year. Which didn't love the West Side Story program that she had last year, but she went out there and just, you know, tried to sell it every t- single time that she was, that she skated it. it, just didn't seem to go well. These programs that she had this year, like the summertime, seemed to work a lot better. And we've seen glimpses of greatness from her at times this season, but she hasn't been able to put it all together in a single competition, and here was really no different. Good in the short program, not great, but good. And then the free skate, again, I didn't see it. Looking at the score sheet, you know, she only had one fall. It just looks like she had some rather underwhelming landings at times. And, I mean, 109 is what she got in her free skate, which is not great. And she had a, like a five-point lead going into the free skate, but she ends up losing by eight points. So it was a, it was a rough free skate for her. She had some very interesting comments after the event, which I found very strange where she was like, I am hugely disappointed. I could have walked away with that same skate without even trying that hard. Nothing felt comfortable today. She said she'd had a very good few weeks of training and that it was a waste of everyone's time, including mine, in regards to her skate, which, okay. She was obviously very frustrated Her coach had some very strange statements. She said that the event did not feel like a nationals this week. It was hard for her to feel nervous or that it was a big event and talking about Madeline Skeezes. She said that, I don't know if she was referring to the size of the crowd. Um, Said that she pointed to the winds boy arena event layout in which many of the skaters can mix with the public and a sparse crowd at events contributed to the 2024 championships not feeling like a normal nationals so you know interesting comments from the coach i i mean i don't think she's wrong i just don't know that i would have said those comments publicly or not but fair criticism and so, I mean, now, is this going to affect Madeline Skeezus in the grand scheme of things as t- in terms of world assignments or anything like that? No. I mean, she's still going to go to Worlds, as I mentioned earlier, because she's the only one with tech minimums. So she's slated to go to Four Continents in a couple weeks, and we'll see how she rebounds from that. The rest of the results, at least of the name skaters that we're aware of, Sarah Ma Dupuis was in sixth, and Justine McClett was in eighth. So those were the two skaters that we have seen. We saw Justin McClett at Autumn Classic. I believe she was third right behind Kai Ruder. And we've seen Sarah Ma Dupuis. She had this great top 10 finish at Four Continents. Hasn't really been able to capitalize on that since. But those two are the only ones that have tech minimums for Four Continents. And so that's who's going to Four Continents. There were a lot of skaters in between there. So in third place was Hedy Shi. In fourth place was Yuliana Shuryeva. Not exactly sure. Fifth place, Fian Landry. Sixth place was Sarah Mont Dupuis, as I mentioned. Seventh, Audrienne Foster. And eighth was Justin McClett. So the issue with Sarah Mont Dupuis, she, like Kai Ruder, does not have tech minimums for the short program, but does have tech minimums for the free skate. And Justin McClett is completely the opposite. She has tech minimums for the short program, but does not have tech minimums for the free skate. So I think that she might be the closest to be able to get her tech minimums at four continents if she had a decent free skate. Sarah Maud Dupuy, I think, might be a bit of a tougher road for her. Again, it would just be nice to have a backup, right? If something happened to Maddie. 
it's just ridiculous. They didn't send anybody to Warsaw Cup or Golden Spin to help anybody get any tech minimum. So I don't know what Skate Canada is doing. Okay, let's move on to the absolute hot mess that was the men's event. And I saw more of this event than any of the other disciplines because it was the last event both nights. And again, it was frankly depressing to watch. Now I have been giving Canadian men the blues all season because they've been awful all season. We haven't seen Roman because basically he was punished after his rough skate at nationals last year. They didn't send him to four continents or worlds. They gave him no Grand Prix assignments this fall. They basically assigned him to a couple of challengers. And in both instances, he was not able to compete. One of them, his skates didn't show up. And then the other one, I can't remember. Like There was some other issue with, with the other one. And so, gets here. Skates get there. And I'm like, okay, Roman's gonna win. Because we've not seen anything out of any of these other skaters. That did not happen. <laughs> so... It was a sad event. It was won by Wesley Chu, who wins his first national title. He had a great short program, went out and landed a clean quad. Triple axle wasn't perfect, but good enough. And he got almost 89 points to win the short program and had a humongous lead going into the free skate, which he very much needed because his free skate was awful. <laughs> it was it was not good. So, and it was funny because when, when he went out, I was like, there's no way he's going to have two good skates in a row. And he didn't. And you, you, you were hoping that maybe he just would have like, at some point, like gone conservative, you know, but he had two falls. He fell in his quad toe and he fell in his triple axle and he popped his quad sow into a double in his triple edge, triple toe later in the program wasn't great. So it was very messy. He ended up third in the free skate. He did win by a decent margin still because he had such a large short program lead because the short program was worse than the free skate was for the field. But he wins. It just felt so underwhelming when he won because it just wasn't a just wasn't a great skate. And Wesley is I've been very mixed on these programs all season. I haven't loved the Romeo and Juliet free skate because I hate the kissing you music. And even though he skated it well, I still didn't love it. Friday night. And then in the free skate, you know, it's the Kill Bill, which I don't think really fits his style. And then plus with all the mistakes, it just, you know, and then there was no crowd to try to help pump him up. You know how sometimes, you know, at like a Grand Prix event and the skaters just having a rough time. It's like the crowd starts clapping and just kind of like gets behind them. There was like none of that at this event because there were five people there. So anyway, okay. So he's national champion. Congratulations. And I'm sure that Skate Canada is have supreme confidence so much that they haven't even named their world team. So we don't even know if Wesley's going to be on the world team, <laughs> but we'll get to that. Um, in a second, we talk about the the Four Continents team anyway. I do think that he's got a good shot at being named to the world team. All right. Number two here was Alexa Rakic. Um, we have seen him this season at Skate Canada. I thought he had, a, I thought he skated decently at Skate Canada, even though he was in last place. It, it was more of a case where, if I remember correctly, he had a good like opening it just kind of fell apart towards the end but I really liked what I saw from him and here he actually won the free skate he his quad didn't go well his triple axle didn't first triple axle didn't go great but the rest of his program was pretty decently put together and he has you know pretty good program components for a Canadian skater <laughs> sounds terrible to say even though he was six in that department, um, I, I thought his both of his skates were enjoyable. Second in the short program, first in the free skate here. He was awarded with a, a spot to Junior Worlds, not four continents. He is one of the men that does have tech minimums for Senior Worlds. And so it's not out of the room that he could be named to the, the world team. But I definitely don't, don't see it. I think we're probably going to get 
two of three different people that were assigned to four continents. Third place here was probably the savior of the whole event, Anthony Paradis, who I believe is the reigning junior national champion for Canada. And no, no, he won junior nationals in 2022. He was third juniors last year. So former junior champion, such a breath of fresh air in the short program because he just has this fantastic skill of just entertaining. He has just beautiful artistry that really came across in the free skate, especially. And so the crowd, what sparse crowd there was, was really behind him in both of his skates. You could really feel it in the short program. And then in the free skate, super, you know, super crazy. He starts off, starts really, really well. And then all of a sudden he lands a jump and he immediately goes to the referee and holds up like what looks like a, you know, three and then leaves the ice. And Ted Barton's like, he has some kind of an equipment issue. He's taking the deduction for the three minutes. He's got three minutes to fix whatever his problem was. And it was like, uh, or if you've ever watched NASCAR, it's like they go and they do like the tire change and the pit crew is like super fast and they run them back out there. It's amazing. That's what this was. Whatever happened, they fixed it. He went right back out there. He got right back into his program. It was so efficiently done. And very compelling kind of at the same time because he was skating so well and he came back and continued to skate so well. He's just got amazing flexibility. Like he does this great Billman spin. He has a really nice spiral. He's just one of these skaters that you see and you're like, there's something special about that person. He doesn't have a quad. He doesn't have a triple axle. He's like only 16. It's okay. He will go to Junior Worlds. I think people are going to be really excited to see him at Junior Worlds and see him again and probably in better lighting. <laughs> but he was like a breath of fresh air. He was only fifth in the free skate, but was able to hang on just by a hair over Conrad Orzol to hang on to a podium spot. So big coming out party for him. And most of us had no idea who this person was before Friday. And now we're all big fans. So that was exciting. All right. And fourth here was Conrad Orzol. <laughs> And it, night and day, I mean, basically night and day. He was 10th in the short program and second in the free skate. His free skate still wasn't really good, but it was better than the short program. And 10th in this field is bad. <laughs> okay. He had, for starters, supposed to do, I guess was supposed to be a quad sal cal triple toe in the short program. And he... Tripled the sow cow instead of the quad. So a triple sow cow, triple toe is okay. It's obviously not the base value he was going for, but it was okay. Problem though, in that next jump, and I've talked about this before on the podcast, he has a planned quad toe. And he only gets a triple off. That's a problem because he's already done a triple toe. And this happens sometimes with skaters in this very situation. They have some type of a combo with a triple toe on the end of it, and they do a quad toe, and they don't get that quad toe out, and that invalidates that's that triple toe because you can't do two of the same jumps in a short program. They've got to be different. So lost that, then he pops his axle invalid element you've got to do at least a double so two elements completely invalidated and the one jumping mass that he did have was not what he had planned so it was a disaster he got you know fourth in pcs so he got saved by what it probably even should have been because if you've seen conrad skate he doesn't have the best program components either and so he really had to dig himself out of the hole in the free skate so he He does. Again, didn't do the quad sale, which is probably smart. Just did the triple. Did get one quad off in his quad toe. Not the best technical effort that we, that he could do, but frankly, far more important to be clean. And, And even with that, he had the cleanest 
skate technically of anybody else in the competition. He had the highest technical score. Now he was sixth in program opponents and fairly so. So again, you had him fourth in PCS in the short program and you had him sixth for basically a clean skate in the free skate. So to me, that says that perhaps you overscored his program components <laughs> in the short program because that performance was worse, but I get it. They were trying to help him out. So he ends up fourth almost on the podium and basically somewhat salvages his Canadian nationals. And so he is on the four continents team and he will get another shot, obviously to try to get on the world team. Fifth place here was Matthew Noonham, who I remember seeing, but I can't remember anything he did. Um, so moving on. Number six was Roman Sadovsky, who I said on Twitter before he skated, Roman's going to kill it. I don't know what anybody else is going to do, but you know, Roman's going to kill it. He's got something to prove. And <laughs> he comes out and pops his quad salco into a double and then only gets a double toe off. So double salco, double toe. He got 0.65 on the element, basically nothing, just basically nothing. And then he fell into triple axle. So he was kind of, he wasn't in the Conrad camp, because he didn't have two invalid elements, but he had in basically a a nothing jumping pass and a jumping pass that was worth half plus a deduction. So it was, again, not a great situation for Roman. And he found himself in seventh place. But again, it was a fairly poorly skated short program. So he was only about seven points out of second place. And even the... 20 points he was out of short program frankly with the way the men skate the canadian men it wasn't completely out of the question he even could have won but it definitely wasn't out of the question for him to be on the podium i still expected him to come in in the free skate and just do better and he was fourth in the free skate but didn't really do better two falls not good and he ends up again six overall and Again, he wasn't so far away from the medals. He was only about five points out of the medals, which is basically the value of a triple jump. Just one less error somewhere, and he could have been on the podium. And I said, I'd still send him to Worlds. This is his first competition, not just this season, but in a year. We have not seen this man since last year at Nationals when he bombed. And he is by far and away the best skater that Canada has. And nobody else has done anything in the past 12 months to give me any hope that they can do any better. I mean, he still has the highest scoring potential. I would still put him on the world team. So we'll see what happens. He also is going to be on the Four Continents team. He didn't do himself great favors here, but he also didn't take himself out of the running like he did last year. And I think Ted Barton made a fair point on the commentary that we have not seen him in a year. This is his first competition. Just doesn't, probably doesn't have his competing legs under him yet. So he'll get another opportunity at Four Continents to show what he's got. And we'll see. And frankly, again, what I've seen out of Conrad and what we have historically seen out of Wesley Chu, I'd still put Roman on the team. So seventh place, uh, Rio Morita had a really nice short program. Really enjoyed him. The free skate did not go as well, but I thought he rebounded really nicely after a rough, rough start. So the four continents team, as I mentioned, going to be Wesley Chu, Conrad Orzel, Roman Sadovsky. They have not named their role team, so obviously they're basically doing kind of like they did last year. They're going to have a another set of skates before they decide who's going to be on that world team. And I think any of these guys are in the running. So there's one guy I have not mentioned, and that is Steven Gogolev. He did compete here, but apparently was injured. It wasn't really clear at the time, but his coach later said that he wasn't even doing like double jumps a week before this. And so I'm just asking myself, why is he even here? He looked like he was in pain. He had just a horrendous short program. He... Popped his quad toe into a double and didn't get a combo off. Fell on his quad salco. Popped a single axle. I mean, it was even a bigger disaster than what Conrad did. And so he withdrew. And so I saw a lot of people on Facebook 
especially complaining that Gogolev wasn't named to the Four Continents team. And I'm like, okay, first of all, the man was injured and he withdrew after the short program because he was injured. What do you think he's going to be better in two weeks when Four Continents is? So why would you put him on the Four Continents team if he's not healthy for starters? And secondly, what has he done this season to warrant getting a Four Continents? I mean, he's been awful. Awful. He was 11th at Skate America, 7th at Grand Prix France, and it's just, that free skate at France was terrible. I mean, he's just been bad all season. I mean, he hasn't shown me anything to think that, so I I didn't really understand some of the, the backlash about that that I saw on some of the figure skating groups on Facebook that was just a bit weird to me. Uh, let him heal whatever injury he has and we'll see you next season and hopefully it's better than this because it, it, it multiple times it hasn't just been, been just me i've seen a lot of people on reddit twitter being like does he even like figure skating because it you, you don't see it in his skating and as as much flack as i have given conrad at least at times i feel like there's something there whereas when gogolev skates i just feel like That this just isn't it. (laughs) And maybe next season he comes back re-energized. I don't know. But uh, I I think we've seen enough this season. Okay. So. Moving on from the men. And moving on to. Oh yeah. No. Not moving on happier pastures. Because now we've got to talk about dance. And we had two withdrawals in dance. So let's just get the big one out of the way. So. A few days before this event. About a. I guess it was a Thursday a couple weeks ago, week and a half ago, that Christine Brennan dropped a complete bombshell about sexual assault allegations, as she called it in her piece. I think most of it was call it rape. Allegations against Nikolai Sorensen from an, an incident that was approximately, I guess, 10 years old that happened with a U.S. skater when he was training in the U.S., And most of you have probably read the story. The details are very graphic. Christine Brennan was on with Phil Hirsch and a Russian reporter with Dave Lease of the Skating Lesson earlier, just a few days ago. It was a great panel that they had. And she talked about that a little bit further as well, that the report came out and I thought she said that she'd had this report for a year. But I thought what we had seen was that the report came out in July. Whatever it is, the report has been out there for somewhere in the neighborhood of six months to a year. And that apparently Nikolai was told about this in October, which aligns with Finlandia somewhere along there, which he didn't have a great skate at there. Could have been a fluke. Could be related. Who knows? We don't know to this point exactly what and when Skate Canada knew what was going on, if they were trying to bury the story, if they were hoping that the story wasn't going to come out until after Worlds and they could deal with it then. I don't know. I think Christine's had the story for some time, but she was sort of, you know, she's got to wait until her editor at the Chicago Tribune allows her to release stories and, and all of those things that go on with that type of media. So, obviously, that would have been a huge cloud over Canadian nationals had they shown up to compete. So they very smartly withdrew from the event. And it was several days before they made a statement. Lolo and Nick came out with a statement basically on the same day that they didn't want to be a distraction. That the allegations are false. And that they're complying with the investigation. Now, Skate Canada, as of today, has named them to the Four Continents team, which is a choice, no doubt. Again, Christine and and Phil Bo talked about, you know, they're in a precarious place, Skate Canada, because if you don't name them to the world's team, then perhaps they can sue because, you know... 
I don't know. It's such it's such a tough situation because I don't think anybody wants them to compete. And if they do compete, then it's this huge cloud and Canada is hosting the world championships. And do you really want that controversy at your event, sucking the life out of it? But you also have this issue of, you know, due process and apparently these safe sport investigations, because they're very underfunded and they're understaffed, take like forever and a day. And so it's not something that's going to be resolved before Worlds. It may not be resolved before Worlds next year. And so it, it's, it's a tough situation from Skate Canada's perspective as to, you know, what's the legal thing to do? You know, the moral thing to do is just, you know, name somebody else of the team, support their survivor. You know, I don't know. It's, it's crazy. And the fact that they've named it the Four Continents team, I'm shocked because I thought they would at least take some more time and maybe they would hope it would die down. I mean, I think it would be a circus if they actually go to Four Continents and, you know, I don't know. I wonder if, you know, media is, is even going to try to, add, and I'm part of the media, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't ask Maddie and Evan, you know, next week that, you know, questions about Lolo and Nick. I mean, that doesn't have anything to do with them. And, you know, they didn't even, probably didn't even know Nicholas Sorensen when this happened. But you, you wonder if because nobody's been able to get a statement out of Lolo and Nick responding to the allegations outside of just their their prepared statement that they came up with a few days ago, if they're going to try to ask other teams, you know, by proxy. Um, I don't think that happened at European, so hopefully that doesn't happen at U.S. Nationals. I would hate for any of those teams to be put in that position. Um, this doesn't have anything to do with them. You know, just trying to get a soundbite. I don't know. I just think it, it's a... Anyway, okay. I'm just going to move on. So obviously that was a big withdrawal. And then our second big withdrawal was really the first withdrawal that we had, which was Marjorie and Zach. And a lot of people have asked, like, what's going on with them? So the word is that Marjorie is in concussion protocol. And of course, that can vary for everybody. I'm most familiar with concussion protocol from the NFL. And oftentimes you'll see athletes clear that in about two weeks. For some people, it's a little bit longer. For some people, it might be a little bit less. It used to be less some years ago, but here lately, they've been giving them more time, perhaps the testing have gotten a little bit more involved. And of course, it's it can be very tricky with figure skating because of the spinning element, you know, overhead lifts, and what have you different maybe from a football player. But they're also named to the four continents team, which again, is she going to be ready at that point? And I and because four continents is in China, visas had to be done quite a bit beforehand and so i don't know that skate canada even has a backup to send marie jade and romaine or you know fabry and Iyer. i don't know if they do in the event that marjorie can't go or that they decide that it's not a good situation to send fournay baudry and Sorensen to. so to be continued on that front because i there weren't alternate alternates named to the four continents team like the u.s named alternates to theirs so interesting developing story but obviously two of the top three teams on skate canada were not at ice dance so that opened up the field for some other skaters so this event was one not surprisingly at all by gillis and poirier they had two very strong skates not big big crazy scores for them in the rhythm dance, they actually gave them a level two in their pattern step and not a level four, <laughs> but they went balls to the wall in the free dance and gave them like 136 points, which is, you know, insane, but they got level fours on everything. I guess somebody sent them a memo. <laughs> they didn't get level fours on their diagonal step, but on their one foot steps and like everything else and, you know, crazy GOEs all along the way. And so... Strong performance by those two, and they are also going to be at Four Continents, so we should get this Chalk and Bates rematch with them, and they might have a little bit of an edge just because they'll probably have time to get to China and acclimate to the time change a little bit better than Chalk and Bates, who are going right, literally right after Nationals, which is a, a choice. 
All right, in second place here was Marie-Jay Laureat and Romain Legoc, and they definitely took advantage of their opportunity here to get a silver medal at Nationals and what I think is very likely to be a spot at Worlds. We'll see on that front, but two really good performances for them, and they haven't been great this season. We've seen them, you know, one of their Grand Prix had a major error and had a fall, but really two strong performances from them here. And I think probably also a big confidence booster to come in and do so well. Also, they were very, very close. That being said to Alicia Fabry and Paul Iyer of, of Canada, they're everybody's of Canada. Um, And the rhythm dance, I mean, they were just barely ahead of them. And they had what was probably like the competition of their lives. I really expected for Nadia and Peter to sort of be in this third place. And that just did not happen at all. They just really, Alicia and Paul just really skated lights out in both programs. A lot of people really, really liked their free dance. Unfortunately for me, I missed their free dance I saw it but I couldn't hear it and I was distracted because I was at work the whole time so I really can't speak to the free dance that they had other than everybody said that it was great and their protocols look great but I didn't haven't loved this free dance when I've seen it earlier in the season so I would have certainly liked to have seen it as it was skated here but unfortunately I missed it fourth place was Henson and Liquors which I again sorry I don't remember them and unfortunately with live streaming like this with no way to rewind if you miss it you just miss it and it just sucks fifth place here was Lanigan and Razgula Fez I probably butchered his name again I've seen them at least one other time this season I can't remember if they were at Autumn Classic or Lake Placid but I did see both of their performances here their Footloose Rhythm Dance, which is super fun, and their Lord of the Dance, Free Dance, which did not score as well from them as they would have liked. You could definitely see the disappointment on their face. I like the Lord of the Dance better here than I liked it when I saw it earlier in the season. I just felt like it felt a little bit more, like it made more sense. Like when I saw it earlier in the season, it felt like a wannabe river dance. And this one felt more like Lord of the Dance, if that makes sense. And then in sixth place was Nadia Bashkana and Peter Beaumont. And big disappointment for them. They had a really strong rhythm dance. I thought they were probably a little underscored, honestly. And then in the free dance, the first half that I saw was great. And then something happened (laughs) that I wasn't able to see the, the rest of their skate. And I come back and I see them get a sub 100 score. And I'm like, what happened? And I asked on Twitter and so I was like, oh, he fell on their circular stuff. And I'm like, of course he did. So, and they basically said after the event that, you know, they were just really nervous. And even people remarked in the rhythm dance that they thought they were, they skated kind of tight, you know? Um, and so unfortunately, again, I didn't get to see the entirety of their free dance. I actually really like the rhythm dance, but not the performance that they would have wanted and again I thought that there was a possibility that they would get a a spot at four continents with Marjorie and Zach being out and with Lola and Nick probably not going but since it seems like they're sending the A team uh, unfortunately for them they are they're not going and even if those two teams weren't there I'm not sure that they would get the spot over Fabry and Ayer who were uh, basically light years ahead of them in the scoring in this event. All right. And the last event we'll talk about is, of course, pairs. And this event, sadly, was kind of underwhelming, too. It just, especially like the short program. I mean, to me, the best, the best team in this event was probably Kellyanne and Lucas, who had the absolute skate of their lives to finish third here. They did really strong in the short program. I've picked on this team a lot because they just haven't been very consistent, but they landed those side-by-side jumps in the short program. They landed their throws and their free skate in my mind was the best free skate of the day. Everything was 
really strong from them. And two, they were so excited because they were skating so well. And so it just, I felt like there was more emotional investment into this pair than it was in some of the others. So, and I think that they did enough here to warrant that third spot at Worlds. I mean, again, we had another withdrawal in this event in that Brooke, Benjamin, and Benjamin, Brooke, Benjamin, and Benjamin Mar. Um, Benjamin and Mamar had to withdraw. And so they were not at this event and they had a really tough fall season. And so I can't really justify them being on the world team, even though they were on the world team last year, even though, you know, just on paper, they would be the stronger of the two teams. Macintosh and Mamar. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Macintosh and Mamar. Just losing my mind here. It's late. And I have gone far too long on this episode about Canadian nationals, but that's okay. So again, the world team hasn't been named, but I'm guessing that Lauren and Ethia are going to get that spot. Second place here was Leah Pira and Trent Mouchot. Trent Mouchot, who just had, you know, okay, so their short program was good. I still want them to work on their twist and perhaps over the summer they will be able to do that because that's one of the areas that they are really behind some of the other teams and in instances like this in the short program where they skated relatively well and Deanne and Max made some mistakes that's a place where they could have leapfrogged ahead of them and they also got a cue call on the triple toe don't know who got that call specifically but they have changed around their short program so the first thing I noticed was she had a new dress a longer sleeves one shoulder out and then the music starts and they're now using like a slower cover of the river mix. And then they go into the original mix by Bishop Briggs of river later into the program. And so I, I would like to see this again at four continents again with better lighting than what I saw here. I was literally watching this at Walmart. <laughs> and so uh, again, not, not an ideal setting, but I need to see it again before I have an opinion about it. I like to watch everything twice before I podcast about it. And unfortunately I can't do this in this, in this situation, but the, the word is that they were trying to maybe increase their PCS. And I guess they think that this new sort of reworked short program is going to do that. It's weird to me to do that so late in the season. Like to me, this white middle wouldn't have been the thing to do. Like, after your first Grand Prix or after, you know, their first challenger, like to do it so later on the season. I don't know if they're going to get the effect that they're looking for, but we'll see what they really need to do is skate cleaner in the free skate because that, you know, they came into the free skate just less than a point behind Deanna and Max. And so they skate first opportunity to really put some pressure on them, but they had some issues with Trent both of the side-by-side -side jumps. He messed up the double axle in the combo and then he fell out of their triple sow cow and then she fell on their throw sow cow, which is most of the time been their better of their two throws. It's usually the loop that they have more issues on than the sow. Um, I'd have, I would have put them behind Lord and Ethier in the free, if I'm being perfectly honest. They, they were just, they just had a lot of mistakes and Kellyanne and Lucas were clean. But even so, they were firmly, solidly into second place and improve on their finish at last year's Nationals. So I think they were actually third there and get a silver medal here. I feel like they've just, in their last two competitions, both here and at Grand Prix Final, have just not done as well as what we saw them do in their first two Grand Prix. And so I'd like to see them at Four Continents and at Worlds really get back to what we saw them in those earlier Grand Prix and maybe even beyond that. And then, of course, the winners here were Deanna Salato and Maxime Duchamp. And they, again, did not have a perfect skate in either program. Really had big problems in the short program. Him on that side-by-side -side triple toe. And then she fell on that triple loop, which has been bugging them all season. It's usually like she kind of ekes out the landing or she steps out of it. And they landed a beautiful one in the warm-up. And got to the event itself and she just like belly flopped. It was a bad fall. And they still managed to be ahead of Leah and Trent on the strength of the other elements in the program. Level four on their twist 
And so better side by side on those other elements than Leah and Trent, even with the two mistakes. And I hated it for them because I really love this short program. It's so dynamic. The music is such a great match for their power that they have developed in this season. And then in the free skate, the free skate was much stronger than their short program was, but they still had issues on the side-by-side jumps. Max fell out of his triple toe again, but then Deanna put her hand down on the double axle and she turned out of their throw triple sow. So um, a lot of, again, little issues with the jumping elements, only a level one on their death spiral as well. So a lot of points left on the table. Obviously they didn't need it here, but those are things that they're definitely going to need when they're up against you know, the other Europeans at Worlds. Not exactly sure what the layout's going to be at Four Continents. I no idea if we're going to see Mira and Kihara or not. If not, then they're by far and away the favorites going into that event. Certainly have, you know, a good looking Chinese pair, but their side-by-side jumps are less reliable um, than Deanna Max's. So, all right. Well, that completes my coverage of Canadian Nationals after my long um, rant and plea with uh, with Canadian with Team Canada. You know, I don't know if they need new leadership, better developments. They need to do some fundraisers. If the team as a whole needs some sports psychologists, because Conrad also said, like after the short program, that he didn't really feel nervous and he needs to feel nervous in order to be able to skate well. And that's just weird. It's just weird. All right, if I'm giving a Pamchinko award out of an entire Canadian Nationals, well, that's easy. Anthony Paradis for not just both of his skates, but that whole thing with his, with his boot. So he got a five point deduction for that, which is a deduction for that three minute. And he still won a bronze medal. So he gets the Pamchinko award and was the biggest light. And what was a very underwhelming event as a whole. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for listening to the podcast. I will be back with multiple European recaps. You can find me on all the socials at Ice Skate Podcast. Have a great rest of your week.